Welcome to the Production Talk podcast with me, Jan of MixArtist.com.au. In this podcast series, we celebrate the modern way of producing music. We want to talk about all things related to songwriting, recording at home and music production. So if you produce your music at home, this is the place to be. Please subscribe and recommend this podcast to all your friends. This is the Production Talk Podcast, episode 56. Welcome back to another episode of the Production Talk Podcast. At the beginning, as always, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country that we are meeting on today, the Arakwal people of the Banjalong Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Much respect. With me today is Mr. Adam Gardiner. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You are very, very welcome. So it's a special time for you. Um, it was actually, you know, on the fence whether we would be able to meet today or not. <laughs> uh, some exciting things are happening. Are you happy to, to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you're referring to there are, are four days remaining until the due date of my first child arriving. So yeah, very excited, wow. very pumped. Yeah. <laughs> well, all the so emotions it, at once. It's yeah, it's exciting. I feel ready. I mean, could happen any moment. It. So you might get a phone call in the middle of this interview. Who knows? Y yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I forgot to mention that before. My phone's not on silent because of that reason. So yep. if I get you a text or a ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Well, look, uh, there's a good chance by the time this uh, episode is released, um, your child is already there. Yep. Fingers crossed. Oh, All the best. You never know. Exciting times. So I really <laughs> appreciate you making time at this tense time of your life. Oh, my pleasure. Um, let's talk about you and your musical career. You are a drummer. Uh, what made you pick up the drumsticks? <laughs> How old were you when you decided that you needed to hit things rhythmically? Yeah, well, um, look, I, I'm, I'm in the Northern Rivers now, but I'm from the Gold Coast. And um, I guess it's interesting. I've never really stopped and thought about why drums. Um, I think many... It's this, a similar story for many drummers, right? You're just sort of drawn to it. And before you know it, you're hitting pots and pans and cushions and all that kind of thing around the house. Um, but I, I didn't really start like formal training, let's say, um, until I was about 12. And um, I was lucky. I had a really, really great drum teacher um, who just sort of, I think the biggest lesson he taught me was just like, you just need to put the time and experience in behind the drums. In other words, say yes to any opportunity that you have, even if it's mm. something you, you're you not really into, like a concert band or something like that. I wasn't particularly pumped about joining, but I signed up just to get the experience and put the time in. And I think that's one. You mentioned tips and tricks and stuff like that. That's one. Yeah. Like yeah, very good. valuable piece of advice. Um, but yeah, I was just, I think I, I picked it up quite quickly and um was very became very serious about it and was practicing a lot every day. Um, it was a funny situation at home. My room's sort of in the middle of the house. So when you open the window from my room, it's into the living room, <laughs> where which is where my drums were set up. So yeah, right. I would literally sometimes, as a, we're talking like 12, 13, I'd just roll out of bed, jump out my window onto the drum kit and just start practicing <laughs> like straight away. I was just that keen. Um, well, yeah. And it's kind of funny on the Gold Coast around that time, we're talking like sort of early two thousands, um, drumming competitions were like a big thing, like a big deal for mm. a teenager at the time. Um, and I entered a lot of them and I guess that sort of showed me the value of goal setting and working towards your goals, that kind of thing. Um, and of course you're learning, I was learning really technical like I was very into the Dave Weckl band, if anyone knows <laughs> Dave Weckl, great drummer. Oh, yeah. yeah um, and I was just drummer. like, oh, man, yeah, I was pumped on Weckl and just learning. I'd just buy the album. And back in those days, you could buy the the book with the backing tracks for the whole album, and it would have all the charts for all the songs in it. Um, and I would basically just learn all this really technical repertoire and enter these drumming competitions. Um, and like that sort of 
becomes your identity as a teenager. Like when you start doing well at something, be it sport mm. or some, any other endeavor. For me, it was drums. Um, and that really just became part of my identity, which I think was such a such a beautiful thing to reflect on and realize how important that actually was <laughs> to my life yeah. back then. Um, but yeah, th- there's mm. photos of me as a kid and it looks like looks like I'm some athlete or something because there's all these medals and trophies and like because I just won I won a lot of them um and it kind of gave me the drive to to keep winning and keep pushing further and setting new goals that kind of thing well fantastic um, look I started as a young drummer but um you made some better decisions than I did because yeah. I wasn't really I didn't have the discipline practicing and uh, I just you know kept on playing fast and loud <laughs> basically the things that are already new and, and never really got anywhere so i guess yeah. that explains you know why you are still a successful drummer <laughs> these days so can you oh, shine some you. light on on the projects you are currently involved with well so i mean as a drummer uh in the local area i'm playing a lot with local cover bands and a few um a few various artists around the around the traps um but really my main focus when I'm making music from home, it's all about sync licensing. Okay. So I'm working with various, let's call them publishers, or I mean, maybe we should call them companies. There are companies out there that are looking to work with people that make music so they can pitch that music to TV, to video games, to films, to advertising, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's been a big focus over the last, I'd say probably three years I've been on the journey of trying to do it quite seriously. Um, and it's been working out so far. I mean, I'm still on the journey. I'm still building and growing. Um, but yeah, so there's those projects <laughs> and that looks like, it looks like a few different things. I'll unpack it a bit further. So yes, um, please. it might, it might be um, a company might ask me to make an album. And when I say album, it's not going to be a commercially released album that everyone can just listen to on Spotify. It's more like they've heard this show is looking for a song that sounds like X, Y, Z, and we want you to make 10 tracks that sound like X, Y, Z. Mm. So we can pitch them heaps and heaps of music. Um, and then they release that album, but through their own sort of pipelines and it goes out to other publishers and people that are making shows and advertising and that kind of thing. So it can look like that. But it can also look like you get an email and it's a similar thing. Oh, we heard this show is looking for this music, but we need it tomorrow. <laughs> so oh, can wow. you make, <laughs> yeah, well, tomorrow is probably like the smallest window I've ever had, but it can often, you can often be sent something Friday afternoon and they need it by Monday morning, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, more recently, some briefs are, Uh, having deadlines of about two weeks, which is a, a bit nicer. <laughs> gives you time to create a bit differently and kind of take a bit more time with it. Um, but that's mainly what I do. Uh, and there is, I mean, the bottom of the barrel is Adam Gardner, the artist who has some music on Spotify. But really, I mean, there's I've got some new music coming out in October and that's really the first step towards the artist <laughs> journey, but I haven't really thought of myself as the artist until this first step that I'm just doing now. So yeah, mostly wow. all sync licensing and music for other people who need it, which um, I think that suits my general demeanor and personality really well though. Like um, I feel really lucky to have found this little niche within the music world that seems to just fit the way I'm wired really well. I really like making something for someone else and them validating me by saying, Oh, great job. <laughs> We wow, need yeah. that. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And even, even like the, the fast deadlines, um, I think lights me up creatively. Like if, if you told me, Oh, make one song and you've got like a month to make it. <laughs> I don't know how well I do <laughs> making that song. <laughs> if you tell me you've got a weekend to make it, I'm like, yes, let's go guns blazing. And I think yeah. that's got something to do with like the limitations you set when you're being creative. I seem to work really mm. well in in certain wow. limitations. Yeah. Look, um, I just need to dig a little bit deeper. You shared so much amazing stuff already, and oh, I yes. just want to rewind a few steps and just um, just talk about sync licensing um, 
just for a little bit longer. So let me just explain it back to you and please correct me if I got it wrong. Yep. So when you use sync license, sing, the songs don't actually go to Apple Music and Spotify and the typical distribution channels, but instead they go to uh, other websites and they sell the license to use your music onto, let's say, TV shows, um, YouTubers, um, places like this, podcasts, I guess. Yep. And uh, you're actually not really selling your music. The, the people buy a license to use it. Yep. And That's you can correct. also sell it on to many people. So you could, let's say, um, sell a license for 50 bucks. But if you sell it to 20 people, that buys you a lunch or two. Yeah. Yep. Is, yeah. Yeah. Got it, got it. Excellent. Excellent. That's so it. Um, um, yeah. I would add in certain cases, um, it sort of depends on your agreement and what sort of contract you've signed, that kind of thing. Because in certain cases, you can also put the music up on Spotify as well. And in fact, the only music I have on Spotify <laughs> is that that agreement. So um, if you look me up on Spotify, I've got like some Christmas music, which I wrote for a publisher who was wanting Christmas music, but they also allowed me to put it up for streaming as well, just under my own under my own artist name. Fantastic. Um, and there's yeah, there's other whatever music you find that's Adam Gardner, it's um it's that type of deal. So it's it's out with a publisher in the publishing world, but it's also out on the streaming platforms as well. Yeah. Do you mind if I go one layer deeper with sync licensing? Um, I feel there's something important to say, uh, mainly because you've used the word sites, and I know you've mentioned in your monetizing music episode um, places like Pond5 and The Music Bed. There's heaps out there. There's like Audio Jungle, there's Art List, um, and these are all music libraries that are generally non-exclusive um, and anyone from the public can just go to the website and sift through, pick a song and license it. And typically we would call these places micro sync. Um, and I guess they would be more used for social media, podcasts, indie films, people's wedding videos, things like that. Um, and yeah, we label that micro sync and a lot of those places are non-exclusive meaning you could have your song say in art list non-exclusively and you could have that same song in audio jungle non-exclusively the music bed non-exclusively etc etc um and these places they also have exclusive music as well so if you have a song in the music bed and it's non-exclusive um, a client's going to come to the music bed and say, hey, we need a track for such and such. And the music bed's going to pitch their exclusive stuff to them. Um, so I think that's really important to point out. Yes, non-exclusive is cool because you can spread around your tracks to all these different places. Um, but they generally just sit there and become more of this micro sync world where people have to go to the site and find it and license it. And normally that ends up being sort of the smaller syncs like social media etc i just thought that was important to point out um if a company has exclusive music they're going to be pitching that because you know they want to have the coolest bestest music that only they have and clients have to go to them to get it um and yeah for me i've been on the journey about three years and i've been fortunate enough to find about 50 placements in reality TV, and all of those have come from this exclusive deal with places. I don't have any non-exclusive music actually anywhere. So there are other companies as well out there that don't do any micro sync. And um, these are the ones that, yes, you can visit their website and it'll say what they do and it'll show all their featured placements and the work they've done and stuff. But people from just members of the public can't go there and license their music. It's more set up for kind of clients go to them and reach out to them. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really worth doing your research and finding out what area of sync licensing do you want to focus on? Um, me personally, I'm focusing on reality TV. So all the companies, all the publishers that I work with, I make sure that they have a, a lot of client base and a lot of connections um, in the reality TV world. Um, and there's ones that kind of specialize in video games. There's ones that specialize in advertising. 
There's ones that just do albums, like I said earlier, and there's ones that just do like custom music and a lot of work, spec work and that kind of thing. And just lastly, um, I think it's worth pointing out the reason I'm playing all the instruments and doing all the recording and being the one man band, doing it all myself um, is because it's kind of important as well in this line of work to be what we call one stop. As in, if someone needs to legally clear the rights to license a song you've made, but actually there's like five other writers, say you've split the the songwriting copyright with members of your band, each every member of the band, all five people would have to sign off when a track gets licensed. So in my case, I'm doing it all myself. So I own 100% of the the songwriting and the publishing and the sound recording. All those rights are mine. So when I work with the publisher, it's just me that has to sign off. If um, you can imagine, sure, there's time pressures for me to make the music, but even the people that are making the shows – there's an even greater time pressure. The poor like music editor has got like a producer telling him like, we need this episode finished right now. And you know, he's, he's got to like splice all the music together and everything underneath. And he's kind of picking the songs and um, say there's a choice between one song and it's got a bunch of splits and like five people have to sign off on it. But then there's my song there and it's just me. I'm one stop. I just sign it or my publisher just signs it. Um, that's really important as well. Be Make sure you're one stop. Even if there's a bunch of writers, put something in writing saying that only one person can sign on behalf of everyone, something like that. It's going to be really helpful in the sync space, definitely. Yeah, right. And uh, do you find that the music that you publish on, on sync uh, platforms, is that sort of seasonal? Uh, does it get picked up straight away after you release it and then it ebbs out and you don't get much traction or is this ongoing? Do, you know, do people still buy licenses to sync your music over the years to come? It's a yeah, great question. It's a bit of, bit of both worlds. Um, but I think for me that brings up the concept of longevity in the music you're giving these, these places. Cause yeah, it could be sitting there for like 10 years before it gets picked up. And you hear you hear that those sort of stories in this world all the time. Um, I know a friend of mine who's in this same space um, told me the other day, "Oh, I get paid monthly still for songs I wrote seven years ago." That kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and then sometimes you can give a publisher a song, and then it'll get picked up straight away. Yeah, that can also happen. Okay. Um, but the idea the idea is um, kind of like I listened to your. I've listened to a few of your episodes. Great podcast. I'm, I'm <laughs> so pumped to find you. Um, but I've listened to some of your episodes and you talked about royalties, how it's like a dripping tap that slowly um, kind of gets larger and larger and becomes more substantial. And that's definitely the same for sync licensing. The more it's about growing a big catalog of music. Definitely. That's right. It's it's uh, like a long term investment. Yeah? I'm just looking oh, at the yeah. uh, number of the episode that you refer to, and uh, I, I know some other podcasts where the host always knows every single content on of every <laughs> episode by heart. I'm not that person, but I think it was somewhere in the twenties. Just trying to look this up um, at the same time, but I would say it was probably twenty three about monetizing music. Yeah, I hope I don't stand corrected right. here. I yeah, no, I listen. Podcast. I think you're right because I listened to that one mm -hmm. and I listened to your APRA one as well. I think you mentioned it with in Nikki. Both of those. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. a great episode. Yes, oh, um, Nikki is fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I've just thought of something else yeah. though. Can I can I add to Please. this whole sync licensing chat? There are I kind of see it in um, two separate pathways. So the pathway we're talking about for me is someone who's interested in writing a lot of, let's call it production music or music library music. And your whole goal is to just build up a big catalog and get it out to as many different places as you can. So, you know, the, the royalties can start rolling in and that whole tap dripping analogy, you can start flowing and building. Um, but then there's the, the other pathway is that of the already established artist. So someone like someone like a Bobby Alu, um, his music just happens to 
be so perfect for TV and, you know, in the sync space, but he's already an established artist. So his route would look more like, hey, I've already got all this amazing music and he would be looking for what we'll call a sync agent. So there's also sync licensing agencies um, that they don't want to own any of your music. They just want to be able to pitch it on your behalf and then take a commission later. <clears throat> so they might take 20% or 30% of the licensing fees and the sometimes even the royalties. All the agreements are different. Um, but that's another pathway. And so I'm definitely over here at the moment, but I'm, I want to get that going and kind of building underneath me. But also I'm interested in slowly pivoting into more of this artist space and then getting another catalog that's just with sync agencies that I own everything, but the agent gets to pitch it and exploit it and take a commission later. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that is so true. Look, big shout out to Bobby, who also was on this podcast. So we keep on referring yeah. back to old episodes here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, great podcast. Look, I, I really like what, what you say, because, you know, what you <clears throat> basically put in front of us is that you, as a musician, you spread out your income. It's not just coming from only pub gigs or yeah. only playing, you know, the, the local uh, cafe every, every Thursday. Instead, you get a little bit of income from many, many different directions. And I guess diversifying is probably a good thing if things get a little bit bumpy, like, you know, what we saw yeah. with COVID, where gigs suddenly disappeared. Having more than one leg to stand on is probably a good thing. W yes, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yep, definitely. Fantastic. Definitely. Yeah, and, and the way I understand sync licensing, in most cases, you can actually do it in addition to the normal distribution pathways. I guess that's what you just described and what Bobby would do. Yeah. No, um, yep. Absolutely. Fantastic. And uh, yeah. Well, I hope that one day, you know, a, a big fish like uh, I don't know Burger King or so buys one of Bobby's songs and hands him a million dollars and say, "Here, yes, we'll play it on the Super great. Bowl." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. that would be five million. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah that the, nice, you hear you know, some. That, you hear some yeah. big figures go yeah. thrown out there. So yeah, it's not. Um, yeah. yeah. It's possible. Yeah, he could do I it. Guess that's a bit <laughs> like a but, bit, bit like a jackpot, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You can. <laughs> plan on this so it's it's much better to just you know focus on spreading opening up all the little tabs and get a bit of money regularly yeah that yep, makes a lot of sense so definitely. good I, i'm so glad that we brought up sync licensing because that's such an important uh, aspect i believe of of you know a musician's life um yeah but in order to to produce the music that must be really challenging you said that you sometimes get a day or a weekend notice to produce a song um, I know you as a drummer, but that means you need to be an entire band, an entire orchestra at times. So talk me through a typical production. Let's say I'm I'm a TV promoter. I would like to you know, book a song from you for my TV show, and I give you a certain theme. It's got to be happy. It's got to be uplifting, and it needs to remind me of the 70s. Go. H how would you start? Ooh. Brainstorm for me. <laughs> awesome. Well... Right off the bat, 70s, I'm thinking I got to nail the drum sound. I got to nail the bass sound. Basically, the mix has to sound like the 70s. <laughs> I'm already thinking, mm -hmm. how am I going to record it? Um, yeah, I love this question. It's great. Um, so for me, so let's talk about a 70s drum sound. Um, I got some ribbon mics already set up over here. For me, ribbon mics as overheads a very 70s sounding. Uh, you can jump in too. <laughs> if you, correct me if I'm wrong. No, here. no, keep going. Um, keep going. You're and great. I want to muffle the snare drum with a cotton. I've got a, cof a special like cotton muffling ring thing that I made because um, that's a big part of the 70s drum sound. Um, and I would probably, honestly, I would record myself playing drums, but I would probably also use some samples. <laughs> Um, I'm a big fan of the Native Instruments, do the Abbey Road. There's like different decades. So I've just got the Abbey Road decades pack so you can get like the 50s drummer, 60s drummer, 70s drummer. Um, and that sort of takes the drum sound I'm already trying to create and just kind of flavors it that little bit extra into mm. the right decade. 
Um, if I could just clarify, so you're yeah. using that to add to your to your signals? Do you blend it in, or do you actually replace the drums that you played with those samples? Yeah, well, so, yeah. Sometimes I would just mute my kick mic, my snare mic, and just have the samples and the overheads. But normally I would do a blend. Um, yeah. And in this case, I would probably do a blend. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and for those who don't realize, you can just you can highlight your kick track and replace hit like replace with MIDI, and it'll bring up little MIDI notes of every single kick that you did. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm using to then um, drive into the Abbey Road seventy cool. drummer. Cool. Yep. yep. Um, and you know, you tweak all the all, all the um, velocity and like all that kind of stuff. You can get into the weeds. I see that gives you a lot of control. That way you can literally play, um, you know, a 16 inch kick drum if you want to today or an 18 inch tomorrow or, you know, a really deep 24 inch the day after tomorrow. So you don't actually need to yeah. own all of those drum sets. You yeah. can play your drum set and it still sounds like different kids. Got it. That yeah. is a smart workflow. And they, okay. oh, they sound great. Like, uh, it, <laughs> I'm just amazed at some of the tools we have these mm. days that are just available to you. Um, yeah, so that's a really valuable tool for me. Um, I know somewhere, on, <laughs> uh, where it depends when I'm recording for other people. I don't like they want to do the sampling themselves, so I don't do any samples in that case. But uh, if I'm yeah, if I'm making a track myself, I'm definitely going to put some samples in there. Um, and then the '70s bass sound, I would probably call a bass player friend and say, "Yo, give me a P bass with some flat wound strings <laughs> that I can use," because <laughs> that's so '70s. I don't have one of those, but um, yeah, I would just I would get some reference tracks straight away and try to nail some sort of bass part. Um, do the best I can. But anyway, is this is this helping at all? You just got to yes, you got to be the one man band, and you got to yeah. do it all yourself. Mix it all yourself, master it all yourself, and all in one weekend. Send it off all in one weekend. Yeah, and, and it, can you it's describe? Possible. Can can you describe the studio that you work from? You know, that sounds like you must have you know a million dollar facility with several rooms yeah. and probably three staff engineers and a tech guy and you know. Yeah, is that what <laughs> well, it is? Is that it what it sounds, sounds like? like? No, no, I do not have <laughs> any of those things. Uh, okay, so I, I've got a. Um, I'm in like a, what is this? Like, I guess a rumpus room sort of situation, a downstairs rumpus room of a house. Um, it's no, no, it's not ideal by any means, but I've got some acoustic foam up. I'm doing the best I can. Um, and I use, I talked a bit be, about ribbon mics just before, and that's intentional because this room isn't ideal. It doesn't sound like a really lovely, nice studio. Um, and I feel like if I was to use condenser mics, which are really, really high definition, really detailed, mm. sure, you would hear the drums in great detail, but you would also hear the, the bad reflections and the dodginess of this room in greater detail. That's true. Which yeah. I want to steer away from. So for me on the drums, the ribbon mics as overheads are the perfect choice because it's, I mean, if, you, if we're talking about like a HD photo, and then a SD photo. It's more like the the SD yeah. photo, and you get all the warmth and the vibe and the character, but you don't have as much finer detail. So it's a bit of a compromise, um, mm, but it works for me. Sense, yes. um, I'm a big fan of when you're tracking the drums, having all the mics quite loudly in your headphones, so you can hear what you know what the mics are actually doing, what they're listening to, and. I think the biggest thing is just adjusting the way you play. It's all about trying to capture a good recording. Mm. Um, and in this room, that's different to just rocking out live. I've got to play a lot softer. There's a lot more muffling and yep, a lot. It's basically just changing the way I play and being sensitive to what the mics are actually capturing in this okay. room. Yeah. So you're doing all of this out of your home studio. It's a home studio, that, yeah. <laughs> Barely a studio. A, it's anything a, it's but a, a million-dollar facility, and you still <laughs> yeah. pull, pull that off all by yourself. You play the drums, you record yourself, uh, you w collaborate uh, on some instruments like bass, you said. Um, oh, what about, more like borrow gear. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, sometimes. Okay. Yes, yeah, sometimes okay. um, if a mate's over that's, 
you know, plays a different instrument, I'll be like, oh, jump on this track for me real quick. Um, <laughs> but yeah, usually it's just I'm the one man band doing it all myself, um, which again, it's not ideal. <laughs> if I had more time and like more budget to make a nice recording, I would definitely hire other musicians to do some of the other stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. I reckon and, musicians um, make the records and actors oh. make the TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about guitars, keys, vocals, uh, synthesizers? Are you doing all of that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, so for me, guitar would be a close second instrument on the drums. Um, I picked that up when I was a teenager as well. Uh, my dad's my dad's a guitarist, musical guy, and got me started, showed me all the foundational things. Um, and I guess studying at uni, doing music at uni as well, was really mm -hmm. helpful, just hanging out with other musicians. And <clears throat> you're just always talking about like guitar tone and guitar pedals and like chord voicings. And you're kind of in that world and you just kind of soak it all up and take the bits you like. And yeah, so you just find a way to do it yourself. Um, I'm also, so I should mention, I'm sort of half a musician, composer, half a high school teacher. Today I literally taught high school, <laughs> taught like maths and English and random subjects. But being uh, in the music classroom as the music teacher, you just have to jump around and with the kids, you got to play all the instruments, Often you're singing because the kids are too shy to sing, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I've been doing that for about 10 years. So that's really just part of my journey as well, as silly as it sounds. You just, you got to learn to like, oh, okay, that kid's not here. The bass player's not here today. I'm jumping on bass. Let's do it. Like you just got to <laughs> figure out how to do it. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's fun. I love it. It's um, It's kind of fun discovering new parts and new things on other instruments that really lights me up too. So I love that about doing what I do. What a great combination of, you know, between teaching and teaching kids to, to play instruments and then, you know, also making music and selling it. That's fantastic. You're living the life here, <laughs> living the dream. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> have you done much yes. high school teaching? I don't know. <laughs> I have not, no. Uh, I have a background in education as well, but not high school. So that yep. would be very, yeah, much challenging, I guess, you know. Yep. Um, tell me about your drum set. What yep. kit do you like to play? I can see something under a blanket there in the background. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't identify what it is. <laughs> so this is that same drum kit I mentioned before when I was a kid jumping out my window onto the onto the drums. This no is the same. way. That's yeah. that is the same kit. That's it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. So for those that know drums, this is like an early '90s Pearl export. And it's the Taiwanese version. So there were a bunch of cheaper Chinese ones that were everywhere. But the Taiwanese ones um, were just built a bit differently. Um, and they were everywhere in the in the early 90s. Like when I was a kid, this drum kit was like in all the in on in all the music videos on like Rage yes. and <laughs> TV. It's yes, everywhere. Yeah. 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 Um, and then somewhere in the early 2000s. I feel like all the drum kits got sparkly. They brought out all these sparkly ones. And then this old <laughs> this old bucket of bolts got forgotten about. Um, but it's it's like a workhorse. It's such a good kit. Mm. And um, I, I have had another kit that I don't own anymore, but I have played like smaller fusion sizes, uh, more punchier stuff. Um, but I ended up just selling it because I wasn't really – I didn't feel like I needed it <laughs> yeah, at right. the time. So I, I literally just have this one drum kit. And I just mm -hmm. use it for everything. Um, and yeah, I guess the cheat is the drum samples we were talking about before to kind of flavor it in different ways. Um, but even playing well, live, this mm. is the drum kit. If you've ever heard me play drums at any point on any recording over the last however many years, this is it. This is it. Look, um, in in your defense here, I, I know people who um, play these really expensive Ludwig or DW um, yeah. kits that, you know, just sound phenomenal and they still use samples. So um, 
it's actually quite interesting to see yeah. that you know i don't want to talk down on your kid it's but it's more of a not not a top end but a medium segment drum set is yeah that, you're right yeah i um, uh -huh. don't want to offend you in any way but <laughs> no that's not offensive that's what I'm it is <laughs> amazed that you take you know this drum set and you're so successful with it so that, that tells me a lot about you know how how you pull your sound it's it's obviously not the instrument it's you <laughs> pulling the sound Let, let's talk about this some more let's open another can of worms please yeah 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 uh, this is a question this can lead to fist fights <laughs> drum tuning or EQing which one Whoa. okay drum tuning <laughs> <laughs> that's a big can of worms yeah it is a big can of worms drum tuning slash like muffling and maybe changing what sticks you're using I would mm. try all those things before EQing, definitely. Yeah. Okay. What are you? What um, camp are you in? I'm curious. Oh, look, I'm I'm completely on your side, but um, I have uh, worked with musicians in the past, uh, and I shall not name them. That literally said, "No, I don't, can't can't be bothered to tune my my kid. I'm hiring you. EQ <laughs> the heck out of it for me. Oh, wow. Make it sound like you know million dollar kid for me. And that's why I have you for. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, it, it, you Making can do it to harder. some degree, I reckon. <laughs> you, you, you can do it to some degree. But um, so you, you're on the side that you prefer fixing it at the source, basically, looking at the heads, you yeah. know, tuning them, making it a bit tighter, a bit looser. You know, the, I find that the balance between, you know, the tension between the uh, beater head and the resonant head has a lot to do with the way the toms sing in yeah. a way, you oh, know, the, the sustain, the ring of it. Yeah, and um, you know that's just not something that I've found I can do with with, with an equalizer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. The uh, yeah, I can't believe that. Wow. I should mention <laughs> it just popped into my head mm. while I play this same drum kit everywhere. I've got a few different snare drums and sets yeah. of cymbals and stuff that I swap around. Um, okay. Right, right now there's like a we're talking about seventies. I got a seventies Ludwig Superphonic. If anyone who's yeah, a drum nerd I, can, I <laughs> can appreciate that. I have that. one as well. Yeah, great. Yes. Isn't, isn't, isn't it that, Isn't it like the most recorded snare drum? Or maybe that's it, the Black it, Beauty. It might I keep be, yeah. <laughs> isn't that the uh, the snare drum that Carlton Barrett from, from the Wailers played? Yep, definitely. Uh, I think that's so. It. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, yeah I, think really it's, nice snare I think Ringo had one, right? And mm. then John Bonham has like the deeper version of it, like the 6.5 yeah. deep. Um, yeah, there's a few classic... Like, oh, so-and-so had it. <laughs> uh, but I love it. Yeah, the second I got that and hit it, yeah. I was like, that's amazing. I'm keeping this forever. Um, mm, and nice. I have, I also have a deeper, a 6.5 um, brass snare that I really like. Um, and what else? Oh, I've got a um, a Ludwig Acrylite as well, which is a that aluminium shell one, which yep. you've probably seen a lot, yep. um, which yeah, I like. Nice. Those are the three go-tos at the moment. Lovely. Um, yeah. Look, I want to steer back to, to tuning, if that's okay. You know, um, when it comes to tuning a bass or a guitar, that's a pretty straightforward procedure. And, of course, every guitar player knows how to do it. But when it comes to tuning drums, uh, I hear a lot of different stories of uh, how people do it. Well, what's your recipe? How do you – what's on your mind? When I, how do you – walk us through the process of taking a tom that's not really sitting right tonally and, and tuning it. Well, where do you start? What do you focus on? A tom, yeah. Um, okay, I think the biggest the biggest factor in drum sound is often the space you're playing in. As in, like, I can tune up this drum so in true. this room and make it sound really great. Then I'll take it to a gig somewhere, and it'll sound a bit whack and like not the same. Basically, um, particularly the lower frequency sounds, like the kicks and the floor toms. I feel the game has changed when you take it into a different space. Um, and so tuning sometimes, I mean, yes, I'll try to, you talked about the tension, but like the, the uh, relationship between the top head and the bottom head on the toms, that's a big, a big part of the game. And I think um, for me, the idea is if they're both the same sort of tension, you'll get the longest resonance or like the longest ringing sound. And it just depends how much it's ringing in the room and how much you want it to ring for, what type of music you're playing. You might want it to ring really long um, in certain styles of music and you might want it to be really short and punchy in other styles of music. 
Um, okay. So uh, what would you do if you wanted to, to sound shorter? Shorter? Well, for me, I don't know if it's because I'm a bit lazy or not, but instead of like trying to, if it's the tone of the drum is sounding good, but it's ringing longer, I would go to muffling. So I would put, okay. mm. um, what's it called? The, there's those leather ones, snare weights. I've got yep. a few of those. Those are really nice. Um, or just moon gel or gaff tape. Mm. Um, or like I've got different cuts of cotton that I just tape on sometimes. Um, or just you cut different shapes out of old drum skins. Don't chuck out your old snare head. Cut like a ring with just get a Stanley knife and cut a little ring out of it. Make thin ones, make thick ones, make semicircle ones, <laughs> oh, all that's, different that's shapes. That's a really smart idea, yeah. Yeah, so you can just whack it on and mm. go, oh, is that sounding better? No. like, And it, yeah, mm. it's going to be a different one of those works in different room. It's the room, really. That's yep. Yep. the thing you got to figure out. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the choice of heads, yep. which is, uh, you know, that's a huge effect on the sound. Yeah, um, yep, definitely. So do you go for coated heads on, on the toms for a 70s sound or do you, what, what's yeah, your preference? Yeah, I would do, I would do coated. Yep, definitely. Um, mm. And probably Remo coated Emperors on the toms. I love those. And coated yeah. Ambassador on the snare. Sounds oh, very man. 70s to me. It's <laughs> right on my alley. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I tried mean, other Evans. drum heads, but um, you know, Aquarians have grown on me a little bit, but uh, oh, yeah. Evans have never grown on me for whatever reason. I know yeah, other people yeah. love them, but uh, Evans, yeah. they don't sound good to my set of ears. I, guess. <laughs> I must a say, very I, personal preference. Yeah, I, I was the same for many, many years, and then I've tried Evans. Um, wait, let me just look to see what it's actually called. Uh, ah, so they've got UV is kind of like their latest sort of line of heads. So the UV one okay. is kind of like a coded ambassador. And then the UV two yeah, right. is kind of like a coded emperor. And they're uh, great. I've got them on them right now. Try. Yeah, you should mm. try them. Um, they're very similar, but I know just a, a tiny bit, tiny bit different <laughs> in a way I can't <laughs> describe, but I really liked. And sometimes it's about the feeling of hitting it with a stick in your hand. If it feels... It just feels good using these heads at the moment. Mm. And if you feel good, you're going to play better. So that's yeah, part that's of it right. too. That's right. The, the way the stick rebounds of, of the skin has, has a big yeah. effect on, on how you play, I find. And, Absolutely. You know, so sometimes I just go for a tighter sound on the beater head just for that rebound and just tune it back down with the rezo hand for the yep. fullness. Yeah, cool. Nice, nice, nice. Um Let's talk about microphones on your drum kit. So yep. you spoke about the ribbon microphone that I can actually see in the background there. That yep. looks like, um, just trying to guess what that is. It looks like one of those stereo ribbon mics where there's two capsules. Yeah. Can can you drop a you name can. here? What model yeah, is that? Yeah, so you bang on. It's, um, it's the Nude Stereo Ribbon Mic. I've had I my think, eye on one of those. Can you recommend it? I'm actually in the market for, for a stereo ribbon, so yeah. please convince me. I mean, I I haven't played many ribbon mics to be honest, um, so I don't know if my <laughs> my advice is good. But I I like it. I like it a lot. Um, mm. My only gripe is it doesn't have um, like a logo or like something you can line up. Like it's easy to get it out of phase. Oh, to aim it um, the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got so it. I've mm. I've kind of figured it out and put a little mark on it now, so I yeah. can like nail it every time. But that initial kind of getting it out of the box and trying to figure out like which way does it go? Like wh where mm. are the mics aiming? <laughs> Cause there's nothing to <laughs> tell you. It's a bit hard to figure out. Um, but once you figure that part out, it's great. It's yeah. Excellent. It's like smooth and warm and fat. I love it. It's lovely. great. Lovely. And uh, ribbon microphones are known to have a particularly low output, which usually means you need a preamp with a lot of clean gain. Yeah. Um, is that a problem for you? It can be. Um, on the drums, it's yeah. not a problem because the drums because are a the drums loud are instrument. Loud. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's but not yeah, a big deal, yeah. I have tried to record like finger-picking guitar and stuff like that with it, and it just yeah. didn't work because I don't have, I don't have preamps <laughs> for it. I should get some because I would use it more. Um, mm. But I basically just do have it set there and use it on drums and um, when I do percussion and stuff, 
I just sit on the drum stool and like do my tambourines and my shakers and stuff. Um, yeah, using right. that mic and the percussion is loud enough as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's an, that's a, a good point. If you're going to get one yeah. and you're wanting to record like some more delicate, softer things, you definitely will need some preamps. Yeah. Okay. We're just getting a visitor here. My daughter has just arrived. Mm-hmm. Scarlett, do you want to say hello? Hiya. <laughs> okay. Hey, Scarlett, Scarlett nice to meet you. you. Scarlett, can you just play with your brother outside? I need I 10 more minutes. I want to you. Oh, big hug. I need to go back to work, Scarlett. No. This is work for me. Okay. I want to stay with you. No, I Scarlett, love no, you. No. I, I will play with you in a few moments, but I need 10 more minutes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's going to be so, me uh, very soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just wondering, you know, most of the time I try not to edit the podcast, but I might just cut this out or maybe I'll just leave a smidge of it and let's yeah. see how I go with that. <laughs> um, yeah, look back to ribbon microphone. So I guess the key is to, you know, pair a ribbon microphone with a rather loud sound source and yep. not a, a quiet the sound source, otherwise you might just literally run out of level. But um, there are also uh, active ribbon microphones today that basically have amplifiers built into uh, the body. Oh, and, wow. And um, yeah, they work actually really well. Um, like the Rode NTRs, I've used uh, those yep. many times, and they are heavy microphones, so they're difficult to place uh, because the, the boom keeps on drooping all the time. But um, yeah, they are actually really neat for for piano, even delicate and quiet signals. Awesome! So it sounds great. I love my ribbon microphones, and uh, yeah, look, um, I, I put this on my short list. I need to buy a ribbon microphone in the next couple of weeks. I hope yep. so. Well, that's it's really um, on the list. It's like um, you're getting two at the same yeah. time because it's two in that X and Y sort of configuration. Exactly. Yep. So that gives you stereo sound. Or yeah. if you just pin it down to the center, then you have a mono source that works equally well. Yeah. So lovely. Yeah, that's a really nice, nice tool to have. Mm. Um, what about the other drums? What kick microphone, snare, and tom microphones do you do you like? Um, so I just have the standard SM57 on the snare. Yep, just the top. Um, because I only I only have four inputs, so that's another thing. I will eventually get more inputs and more mics. Um. But yeah, I just have the 57 on the snare, the two overheads, and then the kick, I've got the Sennheiser E906. Is that the right? <laughs> I think the that's The 906, what it's called. yes. Yes, that's the dynamic one. Yes. Yeah, it's a dynamic one. Yeah, that's, one. A, that's yep. a lovely mic. Yeah. 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 Nice. That's, that's literally all you do with four microphones. Well, I guess it makes sense because, you know, you're on a fast turnover you you produce yeah. so fast so you definitely don't want to end up with you know 14 microphones to mix <laughs> what a pain yeah but um yeah I, and do you ever find that you struggle to get the toms or the detail out of your hi-hats or um i mean yes sometimes but again i feel like it's all about capturing the recording so yes i'm all about like playing well <laughs> playing mm. balanced like if the if the hats aren't coming through the beauty of me just being in my own studio is um you can listen back and go oh i'll just do another take and i'll play the hi hats a bit louder <laughs> and, oh that's perfect yeah mix it yeah. in that mix it in a musical way instead of trying to f- fix it in the mix later with like uh, not not the idea. I, I love take. everything you just said. Yeah. This is so right down my alley. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that that's where the magic is. That's where the magic is. It's not yeah. coming out of you know, <clears throat> spending three days with equalizers in Pro Tools or Logic or so, or you know, using all the advanced isotope tools. That's not where it's yeah. at. It's yeah. it's all the performance. Look, yeah. and some of my that's favorite really right on my alley. Yeah. Some of my favorite drum recordings are like Stevie Wonder on the drums. Yeah, with like four mics. <laughs> that's yes. Oh, that's magical mm-hmm. to me. I love that. Yes. Yeah, the Beatles, the yep. kick mic, snare mic, and ribbons on the overheads. That's how they track. Yeah. Four mics. Love that's it. all. All it takes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Nice one. Excellent. And um, so, I guess that when you were saying before how I play all the instruments, um, that's another thing. Like I have the, you know, the comfort of my own space to like figure out how to do the bass part. And if I didn't nail it, I can just delete that, record a better take, that kind of thing. That's really a big, a big part of home recording. Well, just trying to capture good takes. 
and minimal editing, minimal. It'll be easier to mix later if you capture really good takes, good recordings. I, I couldn't agree more. That That is so true. You know, you don't want to make yourself too much work in post. Yeah. Uh, when you track. Yeah. That's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the first. yeah. Cool. Nice one. Um, you said your, your interface has four inputs. Can you, can you share which interface you're using? Okay. Yeah. So it's actually two interfaces. <laughs> um, so I've got the focus, right? Claret, yeah, which I'm nice. talking through right now. Um, and that's, I got the overheads going into that. Um, and I should mention the Claret. It has like a, an air setting that you can put on. And I, I love that on the drums. So I normally have the air setting going. Can, can um, you ex explain what it does? Yeah. So it's just like a bit of a boost. I don't know exactly in the high, high frequencies. It's probably like 10 to 12 K has a bit of a mm. couple of DB boost. Um, and that's where you get, kind of the you do get a little bit more clarity and crispy high frequencies yeah um, which are yeah, nice right. for the symbols and yeah just it's, brings that little extra bit of air especially since you're recording with a ribbon microphone which can be just a touch shy on top yes. end yeah so exactly. that that's yep. a great combination yeah i like that um and okay. then so then the kick and snare are going into a focus right scarlet i think it's called a 2i2 um, just a two, two channel one. And I just plug them both in and cause I have a Mac laptop, you can run it as an aggregate device. Have I lost you or do you know what I'm talking no, about? No, no, no. <laughs> keep, keep going. Keep going. I'm, yeah, I'm amazed. That's it. It, yeah. yeah. It's just, um, that just allows you to use both of the interfaces at the same time. Um, and you, so the Claret is going to be the one that's um, I don't know how to explain this without it sounding confusing, but it's kind of like the boss one and yep. the Scarlet is taking the lead. The follower. Yep. yep, the follower, mm. yep. Um, and that's it. It records really well. There's no latency. Like when I listen back, all the, the stuff that's in the Scarlet is perfectly lined up with the stuff that's been recorded through the Claret. So, wow. yeah, that works for me at the moment. I mean, yeah, as I said that before, there are many things that are not ideal that I'm doing right now, but I'm on the journey and I'm looking to grow and have some more and more <laughs> ideal things <laughs> come into my studio. Um, wow. But yeah, that's how I do it at the moment with four mics. Uh, wow, wow. That's, that's really amazing because I'm just gobsmacked by just how much you make from so little. Um, because when you, you said the Claret, my... You know, immediately I saw the picture in my mind of the big one, you know, the eight-channel um, preamp one, which is, you know, 19-inch and so on. That's that's good enough to record a band. But you've yeah. got the little one then with two inputs, and you just combine it with another interface to make it four, and yep. it all works for you. The aggregate device is something that I have tried before, I have to say, and I gave yeah. up because it wasn't doing what I wanted. Yeah, but I didn't use two Focusrite devices. I used, I think it was one Avid um, Mbox back in those days, and something else. Yeah, and it just wasn't stable for me. But uh, so I always assumed that wouldn't be fit for production. But you proved me wrong here. <laughs> nice, yeah, nice. And yeah, well, what is your what is your DAW of choice? Um, I'm a Logic user, um, mainly because I, yeah, mm. mainly because the. Garage band kind of sucked me in. <laughs> yeah. So, I, yeah, like 10 years ago, I, yeah, if you get your first Mac laptop because everyone was getting them and um, mm. you're like, hey, what's this Garage band? And then, yeah, just fiddling around in Garage band, um, you, can, you can do a lot. It's quite powerful. And, it is. Um, at school, in the classroom, we use it all the time. Um, and it's awesome. It's great. And then eventually, um, yeah, I decided to actually start making music more seriously and bought logic pretty much <laughs> sorry short moment hey listen up kids no miles smiles and skylar i really need you to play outside for five minutes little monkeys <laughs> <laughs> sorry about this i lost my train of thought that's all good it's all good we logic. were just talking uh, how you progress from yeah from garage band and then you graduated into logic logic is so powerful and uh you know the 
features they added recently, you know, they really give Ableton a run for their money mm. um, with the live looping stuff. That's yep. really respectable what they've done. And uh, I find that logic is, you know, considering what you get, it's very reasonably priced compared to other DAWs. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the laptop is more expensive. <laughs> like you have to have a, a Mac, which yeah. can be quite pricey. But yeah, it's the cheapest yes. DAW. If you happen to already have a Mac, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And um, yes. at, you know, at at uni, we did um, we had to do some assignments on Pro Tools, and I think we even used Reason back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I've and I have used Ableton a little bit. So I've you know I've poked around in a few other DAWs, but um, yeah, Logic just seems to be more. Uh, I don't know. I just picked it up quicker. It's more intuitive to me naturally. I think. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's a good fit for you, I guess, for yeah. your workflow as well, because you know you always work so fast. Yeah. Lovely. So, Adam, look, if somebody wants to find out more, where uh, would the listeners have to go to, let's say, listen to your music? Yep. What well, would they search um, for on Spotify or Apple Music? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm on. I'm on all the streamings streaming platforms just adam gardner g-a-r-d-i-n-e-r -E um or there's a website adamgardnermusic.com it's probably the best place to go um and i should mention there is some music coming out in october so you know if you follow me on spotify that's really helpful um you can find me on bandcamp i mean the best way to to support independent musicians is actually to buy their music so Yes. If you want to find me on Bandcamp and buy something, that would be great too. <laughs> yeah, the website yes. website's the best place to find all the info. I will put all of those links into the show notes, of course. So at the end of the episode, please scroll down, click the button, and then you can find Adam straight away. Um, awesome. Say, if somebody is in need of a really good drummer, would you be available for session drumming? Could I just, you know, flick you... Um, my my pilot uh, guitar and vocal and could you lay down some drums for me yep definitely yep i do that all the time um yep. i can record drums and guitars remotely pretty well uh, yeah and that's just you can email me adam gardener music at gmail.com excellent. Um, excellent and on my website you can see there's a, a bit of a session drummer video up there if you want to see see me in action and it's got a a bunch of different genres and styles and stuff. That sounds fantastic. All of those links, of course, will be in the show notes. And look, Adam, once your uh, release is out, uh, give me a little nudge and I'll uh, post this on the uh, Production Talk podcast uh, Facebook community so that all the listeners who subscribed get awesome. a, a reminder Thanks. of that as well in October. Yeah? Thank you so much. Look, That'd be great. Thank you so much for making the time. I wish you all the best for your young family and th the adventures ahead. It's going to be amazing. Enjoy every second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Adam. This was an amazing episode and it's fantastic to have a bit of drummer's chat. That was really, really amazing. So I really appreciate your time. At the time of editing, uh, I still had no baby news, but who knows, that might be different by the time this episode is out on Tuesday morning. It's a nail biter. Um, we are on standby and hoping for, for some good news very soon. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to recommend everybody to please uh, scroll through the ep previous episodes. There were a couple that we referred to today, uh, especially if monetizing music is something that your music business would benefit from. I recommend to go back and check out the episodes in the show notes. In other news, exciting things are happening on my end. I'm settling into the studio rooms and I've had heaps of visitors over the last week and that is really great to see. So uh, again, I'd like to extend uh, last week's invitation to please yeah, stop by and say hello if you want to check out the new rooms. Um, yeah, that's all for today. I hope you had a great time. I will speak to you again next week. And thank you very much. Bye for now.